So we're going to build a software synthesizer in five minutes. Last time I did this, it took 40, so that's no fun. Speakers. I don't know how many of you have taken apart speakers. Awfully fun. They have a permanent magnet a lot of times, and they have maybe a coil and a little uh, diaphragm thingy. And the coil is basically an electromagnet. So whenever you apply some electricity to it, the electromagnet either pulls toward the permanent speaker or away. And if you apply you know, alternating current, it might pull forward and away. And if you were to graph the alternating current, uh, you would get you know, these up and down things from like a, sort of a range negative one to one, for example. And uh, you might get a, a nice sine wave if you're doing something smooth sounding. Uh, that's the hardware part of this. Um, the, uh, the wave has some attributes to it. Uh, the, so the electricity, like I said, is going kind of from positive to negative, from uh, negative one to one, you can think of it. And uh, it corresponds very much directly with the physical movement of the speaker and with uh, the kind of the digital uh, analog of it. So if you make the wave uh, higher, it gets louder. And closer to one and uh, closer to the zero, you get quieter. And if you spread the wave out, you get a deeper pitch. And if you squeeze it together, you get a high pitch. What we can do to make this digital is uh, you have your sound card, which converts from the actual electricity into uh, the inputs. But uh, we slice this wave up into individual little pieces, which are called samples. Uh, the, uh, the width of these is how many samples you fit within a period of time is called the sample rate. So you might fit uh, well, a bunch of those. Uh, for example, if you were to splice it into 44,100 of those slices of your wave in one second, then that's about what a CD does. Uh, you can see some other common sample rates. Uh, the other direction that you're splicing it is up and down, which is called the uh, bit depth. You're always going to be splicing it so that you have numbers that range from negative 1 to 1, but you might have to uh, use a certain number of bits in your machine, and that'll uh, decrease the number of slices you do up and down. So all the 8-bit video games would be 0 to 255, so to go negative, it'd be like negative 127 to 127, give or take. Uh, CDs are 16-bit, so that slices it into 65,000 slices. Uh, DVD audio is 24-bit. When I was learning about this stuff, one of my big questions is, now, what do we actually hear, right? So this is the estimate that I found from Wikipedia and things like that. Other people have different estimates. And this is the optimal. As you uh, get old, you, uh, you can't hear as, uh, as high frequencies. That 40,000 slices uh, in time, uh, because a single wave kind of has to go up and down, that corresponds to being able to hear a sound that is uh, 20 hertz, is what they say, 20 cycles a second. Uh, or 20,000, sorry, 20,000 cycles a second. Very, very high pitched. Uh, once you become an adult, you can't really hear even that high pitched. Uh, and then 21 bit is kind of the optimal f for you to discern different volume levels. So now we get to software. Uh, I chopped out a whole bunch of stuff where I talked about how the um, pitch changes and stuff. To do this in software, what I want to do is generate individual samples, individual numbers that go from negative one to one, and I want to generate 48,000 a second or so. Uh, to do that, what I really want is a nice little function I can call where every time I call it, it gives me another sample, another floating point number from negative one to one. Sweet. So uh, this is a simple generator where if I have time as an input, I can uh, get a new sample out to get a sine wave. This is a more complicated generator. Uh, I actually initialize it by calling this function and end up doing it like this, so that uh, this is actual code that you can run on my system, and that'll make a nice sine wave. This is a more complicated one, we're running out of time. One thing that'd be fun is if I could actually use generators as input. So I used my touch screen, X mouse position gives the XY position, and then that's frequency. So this here is a software synthesizer, which we can play by touching different parts of my screen. And that is my lightning talk. Thank you very much.
Okay, so my name is Todd Anderson, and I want to talk about language learning in the digital age. I mean, the time when we've got uh, smartphones and tablets and computers and uh, lots more resources to work with. A little background on myself is I am a middle school technology education teacher in Northern Virginia, and I have a lot of uh, international students that come through my classroom, many of whom speak Arabic. And so I've been working for the last year on learning Arabic on my own. No classes, uh, no teacher, nothing like that. So I want to talk about mostly how to put in the time and where, you, if you were wanting to learn a language, where you would put in the time to learn that language. I'll talk about content, flashcards, and uh, conversation exchanges. So number one is content. Um, YouTube is an awesome resource for anybody that wants to learn a language. Any language you want to learn, there is content in that language on YouTube. Um, it's just a matter of finding it. Um, oh, I'm, I'm on tools. There we go. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to talk about cheaper tools rather than more expensive tools, and YouTube is, is where I wanted to start with that. Um, the, the key here is being able to do effective searches, and usually that's not in English necessarily. Although you can't find stuff searching in English, the best thing is going to be uh, searching in your target language. Um, some of the things that I watch are um, like people who are also trying to learn. I found lots of documentaries in Arabic that I watch. Uh, every Disney movie ever made has been dubbed in Arabic, so I watch those a lot, as well as, as genuine content from the Middle East. So having an international keyboard, which most tablets and, and smartphones have access to, um, in combination with Google Translate, will give you really good searches that will help you find the stuff that you're interested in finding. So secondly, I want to talk about flashcards. Um, I use a, a flashcard system called Flashcards Deluxe. There are lots of kinds of systems like this. Uh, and they give you the ability to use audio, um, images, as well as text. And they do something called spaced repetition, which means you can uh, let the system know if you know, know the card, uh, you don't know the card, or you know the card really well. And based on that, it will change the frequency at which it gives you the cards. Cards that you don't know well, uh, you'll see more often than cards that you know really well. Um, it will also give you like really detailed statistics about uh, you know, what, what percentage you get right, how often you do this, the time you put in. But this is all really useful information. Um, I have it on my phone. I always have it with me. There is not a perfect ideal time for studying a language or a perfect place. I always have my stuff with me um, so that I can do it at any time during the day. Um, lastly, conversation exchanges. Being able to actually talk to people around the world who speak the language that you're interested in speaking is a very powerful thing. Um, there are lots of people who want to speak English around the world and are willing to talk to you. So here's just an example. This is just this morning. Uh, a gentleman in Cairo contacted me uh, through a website called conversationexchange.com about wanting to exchange our languages. Now these are not professional teachers. They just want to have a conversation. And this is best facilitated through Skype, and everybody that I've ever contacted um, utilizes Skype, so it's a really good kind of standard, standardized program that everybody's using to have these conversations with each other and just learn. Um, I've had conversations with people in Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, Morocco, the UAE, Lebanon, and Iraq. And I, I'm, I'm get, getting some really good friends in these countries, and they're helping me a lot with what I'm learning. Um, when you're learning a language, especially if you're trying to do it on your own, uh, it's important to do something every day. It requires some sort of commitment. Either you're reading, you're listening, you're writing, you're, you're trying to talk to somebody on, the, on Skype, but you've got to be doing something every day. Our days are blocked out with big blocks that usually we can't uh, move into, like my work schedule, my family schedule, uh, church responsibilities, whatever it is. So I call it grouting my day. I fill in wherever I can. And this requires some sort of sacrifice. There's always going to be some sort of sacrifice, whether it's waking up early or all my commute time, I listen to Arabic. Um, the evenings after the kids go to bed, I'm doing Arabic. So it does require some sort of sacrifice to do this. I highly recommend that if you don't speak a second language, that you try, that you put in the effort. You don't have to take a class. In fact, I'm, I'm glad I haven't invested time and, and money in a class because I don't think, I think that I would not move at the pace that the teacher would probably require. Um, in, in the one year since I started learning Arabic, um, well, three months ago at, at nine uh, months, I tested at an intermediate uh, level, and in the next six months, I 
my goal is to test at an advanced level. So that's my talk. Okay, hello, sorry for the delay. My name is Andrew, and I'm going to be talking about ocean sampling. Um, I want to talk about specifically ocean sampling in the Pacific. Um, there's, a, there's a region of the Pacific Ocean called the North Pacific Gyre, and it's halfway between Hawaii and California. And it's the structure of that area is essentially a whirlpool where um, a lot of debris, particularly plastic, is being collected. And there are you know, numerous scientists that are starting to look at and study the plastics that are being collected there because they are being photodegraded by the sun and the wave action is breaking them into small particles. And those particles have a lot of surface area, so they, um, they actually bind with um, organic compounds. And plastics are known to do that. And, and a lot of pesticides and such are organic in nature and they bind to these plastic molecules. So um, I'm just going to show you a couple slides here. Uh, one of the, the, the primary way that people are collecting these plastic components and for scientific study, did it open some kind of, oh, I better close that. <laughs> um, they are using something called a mantatrol, and I don't think you can see this because I don't know how to open this picture. But basically, it is a device that has a mouth and it drags a net behind it. And they pull the net in the ocean, and the netting is about 330 micron mesh, so it's about a third of a millimeter. And they're basically pulling that for a while, pulling out the plastics, and subjecting those plastics to a, spec a spectrometer, and trying to analyze the types of organic compounds that are adhering to these plastics. So you can, um, there are several websites you can go to to, um, to learn about these chemicals, and What's that? Oh, I haven't, um, I guess I haven't shown you anything yet, but there's nothing to see, really. <laughs> I don't know, Katie, can you help? I just want to show them this, yeah. this PDF file, just so. slide it over to the right hand. Oh, side. I see. Okay. Like this? Yes, like that. Oh, okay. So that's good. So basically, um, <laughs> come on, we can do it. I lost the mouse. Oh, Katie, I might need help. It seems to move. I don't know, Katie. I can't do it. <laughs> oh, there we go. Maybe that's what I have to do? Okay. I think I'm getting there. There we go. Okay. Okay. So uh, I want to talk briefly about this paper and uh, basically, scientists are studying these plastics, and there is a t I can, I'd be happy to refer you to this paper if you're curious, but there is a table in the paper, and we won't go into it in much detail, I guess, but basically what they're saying is they've identified a set of samples that they've collected from the Pacific, and they have categorized it as different types of plastic, whether it's a buoy or a bottle or micro fragments, and they've calculated the, uh, the parts per billion that they're finding on these plastic pieces. And what they are finding is that for uh, PCB type chemicals, they're finding numerous samples that have a much higher, obviously, a much higher concentration than what's allowed in the uh, you know, drinking water standards. The drinking water is about one half part per billion. And they're getting examples here. Uh, many of them are not on non detection, so many of them don't have any, but there are several that have 100 parts per billion and several that have several thousand parts per billion of PCBs. And um, there are other types of chemicals, um, hydrocarbon type compounds that are made from soot and from basically burning coal. And those have a kind of a background level in the water supply. It's about 0 0.025 parts per billion. And they're getting many of them that have se several thousand parts per billion. So those are getting concentrated as well. And the last column is pesticides like DDT and you know, that's, oh, let's see, what do I have here? The, um, the World Health Organization says about two parts per billion is, is acceptable for drinking water. And there are several examples of the several hundred parts per billion. So basically, these plastics are 
binding um, to organic pollutants, and these plastics are what is uh, what is interesting is that these plastics are acting like sediments. In the past, sediments would bind to these things, and the sediments settle to the bottom of the ocean. But these plastics are not settling to the bottom of the ocean. They're actually staying in the ocean. So that's why it's a problem. If you want to see, I have an, a prototype sampler in the back that you can look at. Thank you. So I'm going to be talking briefly about cycling from D.C. to Pittsburgh on the CNO Canal and Great Allegheny Passage Trails. Uh, I did this ride uh, this year uh, for the first time in April, um, and I hadn't even heard about it until uh, just a few months uh, before that. And uh, I'd always wanted to do a long distance bike trip, but I'd always figured it was the sort of thing that meant you'd be on the side of a highway, dodging traffic the whole time. And, uh, didn't like the idea of that, but uh, this trail, or these two trails, um, it's possible to do uh, the entire 325 mile distance um, almost entirely uh, off-road on uh, unpaved trails. Uh, it's, a very, uh, it's a very pleasant trip. Um, there are a few stretches where there's detours where you have to go on the side of a highway, but that constitutes maybe uh, seven or eight of the total miles. Oh, sorry. Okay. So this is a, um, I, I, you probably can't see this very well, but this is a plot of the elevation change over the, uh, the, the entire distance from D.C. to Pittsburgh. And um, this looks really intimidating here. <laughs> I had a tough time psychologically getting over that. Uh, but you have to take into account that the maximum grade on any part of the trail is 1.5. Degrees. So the, the CNO Canal Trail is an old uh, canal towpath trail. So um, you know, obviously, there's not going to be any any steep grades to climb on that. And the uh, Great Allegheny Passage Trail is an old railway. So um, it's really nothing nothing steeper than what a train or a, uh, a canal boat would have to go through. Uh, so for most of this, it feels entirely flat. Uh, this part here, I, I did it from. Uh, going from DC to Pittsburgh, a lot of people prefer it the other way because you don't, you don't have to do this. Uh, this is the only part where it feels like you're going uphill. And it's really bizarre because it doesn't even look like you're going uphill because it's, it's still so gradual. It's, uh, uh, and the way the trail curves, uh, I've, I've talked to other people about this, some parts it almost feels like you're going downhill, or it, seems, it looks like you're going downhill, but then you get passed by people going the opposite way who aren't even better. Uh, so, uh, but all in all, apart from this, um, it, feels, it feels flat and it's a very, very easy ride. It's something that just about anybody could do. Um, I did the trip in five days, which meant about 65 miles a day average. Uh, but there's no magic to that number. Uh, you could take your time. In fact, if I were to do it again, I think I'd probably add an extra one or two days, just because uh, sometimes I felt a little bit rushed uh, to, keep, uh, to keep pace. What is a Cumberland at the bottom of the hockey stick there? It's only 300 feet? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's correct. Or, no, sorry, 605 feet at Cumberland. Yeah, and then uh, the top here, the Eastern Continental Divide, is uh, 2,392 feet. So this is where it begins. You can pick up the, uh, the CNO Canal in uh, Georgetown, uh, right under the Key Bridge. Um, you can, I just took the metro uh, to Roslyn with my bike and walked up the bridge and uh, started from there. Um, this is uh, heading towards Great Falls on the CNO Canal. Uh, but a lot of these pictures, uh, by the way, are not mine, so they jump around in seasons. I uh, neglected to take pictures through most of my trip, so uh, you'll notice different uh, foliage on the trees. Uh, this is what a lot of the trail looks like, where it's basically just two kind of tire tracks. Um, and it, the CNO is a little bit bumpier than the Great Allegheny, but um, uh, it's pretty it's pretty smooth throughout. Uh, more pictures. This is it looks like this for pretty much the whole way to uh, Cumberland. And you see a lot of the old locks uh, and lock houses on the canal. Uh, 
That's actually one picture I did take. Uh, so this is one of the highlights on the CNO, which is the Paw Paw Tunnel. And that is, uh, well, it's over 3,000 feet long. Uh, and it's completely unlit. So it's fun. Uh, <laughs> this is where I would definitely recommend bringing a, a headlight uh, if you're going to do this. Um, you can walk through it. I mean, I, I definitely, you, you have to walk through it and, and, and get off your bike because it's dangerous with people coming in the opposite direction. It's a very narrow uh, walkway. But uh, bringing a headlight will definitely help you avoid puddles because it's kind of trippy too. So this is the highest point on the, the, uh, the trip. That, oh, dear. OK. So I'm just going to fly through this thing. And this is the Great Allegheny Passage, some witnessing. I'll just go ahead and, uh... Oh, so this is just, just one thing uh, quickly uh, to note, um, is that the trail is not entirely complete. Um, so there's this one stretch before you get to Pittsburgh here that's about a mile, uh, where this is where the uh, Great Allegheny Passage ends, right here, and this is where the Pittsburgh Trail System picks up. And there's no indication of how you're supposed to get from A to B. And fortunately, I just stood there long enough looking kind of pissed off and confused that someone who had ridden the trails before told me about uh, this. So you have to go through the parking lot of a Costco here. There's a water park called Sandcastle, and you go through their parking lot, and then around the little metal scrap yard, get off your bike, walk about a tenth of a mile next to some railroad tracks, and then you pick that up in the, uh, the Pittsburgh Trail System, which is, which is really lovely. And that's about it. Hi, my name is Bruce Resco. My amateur call sign is N4TCW, and my talk is on amateur radio. And this thing could probably take about two hours, and we'll go real quick through it. Um, First, let's start with definition. Amateur radio, also called ham radio, is the use of designated radio frequency spectrum for purposes of private recreation, non-commercial exchange of messages, wireless experimentation, self-training, and emergency communication. The term amateur is a specified persons interested in radio techniques solely with a personal aim and without pecuniary interest money, uh, and to differentiate it from commercial broadcasting, public safety, or professional two-way radio services, such as maritime aviation or taxi. So history, originally, everything was amateur radio. There was no radio in the beginning. There was some people doing some things with electricity and sparks, and sparks showed up someplace else. And they said, this is interesting. So turn of century, very new uh, field. Uh, Marconi, Tesla, and Hertz were three of the big players uh, in the beginning of radio. Um, in 1912, radio was actually licensed by the federal government because of the whole Titanic issue. And what was given to amateurs was these short waves, which were just garbage. They were useless frequencies. Uh, everything above and including the current AM broadcast band, which is everything we use nowadays commercially. Uh, so people started experimenting. The government realized, wow, this is useful, and then just started taking more away, uh, as it always works. Um, but many pioneering things in the history of amateur radio. In 1961, uh, amateur radio operators put up a satellite, uh, which was the first non-military satellite in the history of the world. Everything else had been military test satellites, but some people who worked in the field were able to get it up on a, as payload, as a ballast on another rocket that went up. And many currently in science and engineering fields uh, got their start in amateur radio, uh, when you think of back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, many facets to amateur radio, uh, international goodwill, uh, technical experimentation, emergency service, Services, contesting, education. Uh, international goodwill, amateur radio has always been a peer-to-peer -peer ambassadorship between countries. No matter what the politicians do, when you talk directly to somebody in another country, you're bypassing all of politics. You're going directly to that person. Uh, technical experimentation, uh, by having the frequencies to use, you can do remote control airplanes, uh, drones, quote unquote, nowadays, I guess they're called. Uh, balloon experiments, tracking balloons. Uh, Hack DC just recently supported a uh, science fair project and the balloon hit uh, 94,000 feet, 97? No, I don't see. 97. Nick, 97,000 feet. Uh, emergency service, which is my main interest, uh, when there's a disaster, normal communications go down. Uh, most recently in Haiti and Katrina. And really, 
because of the simpler, uh, less infrastructure-based systems of amateur radio, they're able to respond much more quickly while the more infrastructure-heavy systems don't work anymore. Uh, contesting, some people try to see how many people they can talk to, so uh, it's like a game you collect points, basically, and you get awards. And education, uh, used a lot for outreach for children, since you have a combination of uh, science, electronics, geography, social studies, many different facets you can roll into the classroom. Uh, modern perception of the amateur radio. It's a bunch of old farts sitting in their basement with big radios that make a, and I see somebody pointing in the back, uh, with old equipment that just uses a lot of power, makes a lot of noise. Well, modern equipment, you have a modern handheld with uh, internet linking, you can talk locally with this, and with internet linking, you can talk all over the world. And with a radio like this, you can talk all over the world directly with no infrastructure. So cell sites, repeaters, fiber optic cables, don't matter. With this radio right here, an antenna, you can literally talk all over the world. And every day I talk up and down the East Coast out of my car with this radio. Uh, and some of the people think of just Morse code and maybe voice. You have digital modes like high-speed data on the microwave bands. You have full-scan, uh, fast-scan television, which is just like broadcast TV. Uh, Slow-scan television, which fits in a normal voice channel. Uh, you have automatic message forwarding systems. Um, IP link systems, where you can log into a remote radio and use it. And the current rev relevance is basically educational tool since the United States has gotten so behind in technology and the ARRL, which is a national organization for amateur radio, actually sponsors teachers to come out for a week to learn technology and take it back to the classroom. Uh, international Goodwill, which I touched on before. Uh, emergency Communications, which is still, even though as the technology gets better, um, still you fall back on not so much the equipment of technology, but the knowing how to operate with technology is the biggest thing. Uh, in modern times, Often, as soon as the normal communication systems get set back up, in, in Miami, where I'm from, we would actually help the commercial stuff get back up. Because an antenna is an antenna. It doesn't matter what you're putting on it, but if you don't know how to set up an antenna, you don't know how to set up an antenna, no matter what it's for. Uh, and recent challenges are homeowner associations limitations of not being able to put up antennas, uh, which there's actually, Congress has, de has decreed the FCC to do investigate that, uh, put in by a ham in Congress. Uh, BPL, uh, Broadband Network Power Line, which is actually using HF radio frequencies for internet access, which has pretty much died all over the world because it doesn't really work very well. General electronic noise from computers, lighting and whatnot, and an aging amateur population just do the perception of the hobby. But uh, like I said, there's still many. In Europe, they do a lot of radio sport where they actually, they run around in the woods kind of like geocaching with radio. It's actually a physical sport. And I guess I'm done. <laughs> Uh, so, I'm Jeremy Pesner. I'm a graduate student at Georgetown University's Communication, Culture, and Technology program. And so, uh, back in the early fall of last year, when I was starting my program, I, got, I, was, I came to this school in order to focus on technology policy, among a, a lot of other things. It's a very interdisciplinary program where a lot of different things come together. And early on, I began to have the suspicion that the way that policy was being made wasn't necessarily taking everything into account, was not using all the factors it needed to, was not getting all the sorts of input that it needed, not listening to all the stakeholders that it needed. And wouldn't you know it, a little something called SOPA came along and proved me right. So uh, my, the, the class I took called Grounded Theory uh, is a very sort of open and uh, exploratory sort of methodology, which presumes no overlying theory with which we have to use. We just go out there, grab the data, and develop a theory out of that. So SOPA was perfectly timed with the beginning of my class, and I chose to look into that. The idea is that we need to explore how the policy around this interesting little act was made. Who was considered, who was not? How did these people understand these sort of internet forces that they were playing with? Who really should have been at the table for these decisions to? What does this mean for the future of internet authority? It's a very tough question. So, uh, for those of you, let me just give you guys a quick overview of these bills for those of you who may not be quite as familiar with it. 
the Stop Online Piracy Act, the Protect IP Act, were versions of the same bill being considered in the House and Senate respectively. Uh, essentially, they uh, would have given the government and other certain bodies of the government broad authority to shut down links to foreign sites, be it either the domain name through the DNS, uh, search engine indexing, and PayPal funding, things of that nature. Anything that it deemed to have pirated content. Uh, the bills were modified and changed frequently, so certain provisions were uh, sometimes there and some were taken out. It was a constantly changing process, but it culminated on January 18th, 2012 in an event that has become to known as Black Wednesday, in which Wikipedia, Reddit, and over 100,000 other sites either blacked out their content entirely or else put very prominent messages up there saying, uh, warning people against the dangers of these bills and encouraging them to call their congressmen. Long story short, it worked. So, uh, I'm, because this is a short talk, I'm going to sort of run through this part here. The idea behind grounded theory is that we can sort of develop codes or concepts out of different data points and samples. One that I think is particularly telling is a small sample from these uh, debates that occurred around SOPA early on, or excuse me, back in uh, December. Uh, I'm just gonna read through here. What, what Representative Watt was basically saying here is that he doesn't believe these, what the cybersecurity experts are telling him. Rep Representative Shafet says, we've got experts, we've got a number of papers from some very qualified people who say this hurts cybersecurity. Representative Watts says, I don't believe that. And doesn't, you know, and Representative Shafet tries to convince him, but basically right after this, they move on. So when we consider how the grounded theory process works, essentially is that we, uh, gather the data, we turn, we put codes and concepts into the data, we uh, memo write it, we sort of document our findings, we uh, sort of elevate those codes to theoretical sampling, kind of larger codes that we can take and sort of search for more data with. We construct the theory and then of course we are always repeating this process because it's not a waterfall model, it is a constantly changing and evolving one. So with that in mind, uh, so a couple of codes that I would have taken out of this small sample, uh, you know, Representative Shafitz is indicating an opinion of expertise through, the, uh, through these computer experts and, and evidence for his argument that SOPA is, is not good as is. Now, what's important representative about Representative Watt is that he is disregarding the evidence. Uh, he is essentially saying that this is not something that I feel is relevant to this debate at all. No, worse yet, he is basically not assigning credibility to it whatsoever for reasons that are frankly not made clear. Um, and Representative Shafitz down at the bottom sorts to tries to challenge the veracity of Representative Watt's argument. He is saying this evidence is in fact worth considering. So there are a number of data sources that I have been taking for this process, uh, through, for this example. That example, example I showed you was just but a small piece of this puzzle. Uh, I have been considering people from the policy spheres, the technical spheres, from the entrepreneurial spheres, and the business spheres. Uh, p uh, organizations like Wikipedia and Reddit, obviously, but also those of the RIA and the MPAA, uh, basically trying to get as balanced an opinion as I possibly can. Uh, and by taking all this data in, I have begun work on sort of trying to understand exactly what the thoughts were and the processes were around this particular bill. However, let me emphasize that this is far from the end. This is actually turning into my thesis for next year, which will hopefully expand on this question much further. How is technology policy as a general trend made, and how should technology policy as a general trend be made? And it's a very important question that I hope, uh, that I hope to continue work on. I need to talk to a lot more people, I need to do a lot more sampling, and I need to use a number of, of additional methods besides this grounded theory one. My professors have advised me that bringing in other sorts of perspectives and ideas can really help for a more thorough and focused investigation. And uh, I hope that uh, as members of the, the reason I'm bringing here you today is that I hope as members of the technical and hacker community that I can count on, uh, that I could be, be able to speak with you, uh, how SOPA might have affected you, how other bills might have affected you. Because even as people who, uh, even as individuals who may not be necessarily involved in the policy sphere, I think, I think it is important for those who are to be considering the opinions of people like yourselves, of, of other users and other people who are using technologies in all sorts of different ways. It's only by 
It is only by understanding the opinions of people across all of these different perspectives, all of these different spheres, and all of these different skill sets that I think we can come up with legislation and policies that shape technology in an appropriate fashion. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks. I'm Alden Hart, um, and I've been working on um, uh, CNC motion controllers. I want to give you an update on the projects. A number of you have seen them. Um, this is a, uh, these are projects that Riley Porter and I have been working on for the last two years or so. Um, I want to cover uh, tech, uh, some community, and some plans on these things. Um, the, the first project uh, that we started with about a couple years back is Tiny G, and still working on this one. Um, the goal here is to bring industrial grade motion control down to hobby level in terms of cost and equipment and uh, also to make it really scalable so you could do many, many, many axes, not just three axes on a machine. So that's what Tiny G is for and that's why it's got RS-485 on it and so forth. Most of the work, 99% of the work has been in the software um, over the last two years, just a ton of work. Uh, it's GPL code base in C, does a six axis motion control. Um, an interesting thing is it does third order uh, jerk controlled acceleration planning, which is um, industrial kinds of things. And you know, EMC and Mach and Garble and other codes don't do that. They do constant um, acceleration. Um, we put a JSON interface on it recently, which is, makes it really interesting to control. Um, the hardware is very basic. I love these Texas Instruments drivers. Uh, it's using an Atmel X Mega, and it's got some neat uh, green LEDs when the thing moves. So uh, Garble is another project um, that does, um, in fact, we started with Garble and forked and, and diverged about two years ago. But uh, Garble has got a huge following. Uh, it's, a, it's a very simple three-axis motion controller. So in order to participate in that project, we took um, three-quarters of the motion of the motor section and just made it plug and play on top of an Arduino. So this is a shield that will do three axes on an Arduino. Um, it's got the same exact hardware on it. Um, and uh, in order to support this, we've started, we've uh, laid out some community sites. So we host these various sites. The, the top one that we, is for support questions. Um, we've got uh, detailed development. Um, we have a user manual basically out on the wiki. And then the GitHub for, bo for both of the projects um, is a bunch of issues and in the, in the code base. Um, and we participate in the Garble side and also at Shapeoko, which I'll talk about. Um, it, a lot of the work went into the code and in the hardware, but so much of it really is about in managing and working through all the community side. I'm on this every day. I'm answering questions. Um, there, I've met a lot of people um, all over the world. We've got people working on a project. So I, I didn't, really didn't anticipate that this was going to be as big a deal, but it's turned out to be as at least as big as the code and the tech itself. Um, so this is a, this is a this is shape Oko. That's that little machine. It's being driven by Tiny G. You can see it off in the corner. Now about 300 of these are going to ship on Monday. Um, where the um, we source the, the goggle shields that the, the, the full kits are using for this. Um, and um, so we've sold a lot of goggle shields, we've sold a lot of tiny Gs. That's, yeah, you can see the board there. So, so that's an example of what the tiny G is doing. Um, the interesting thing about Shapeoko is it's attracted a huge community and it's very hackable. Um, so one of the things that's happened is that there's been a bunch of people who are saying, oh, we can do this. So say, well, how do we move the ball forward? How do we stay up with this? How do we you know, put new things on the table? So one thing is uh, we've uh, developed a, a Palulu driver that's using the TI. Um, this is an early prototype. It's not really the one we're going out with. But it's, um, the TI drivers are pretty indestructible. Uh, the, the, um, so we think it's a pretty good addition to the whole community to be able to do this. Um, we've also got a number of people that are using the system to do much 
a higher current. So we've developed a 5 amp driver, which exceeds the sort of standard equipment that you can get. You know, if I'm going to put a chip on a board, you can go up to two, two and a half amps. Um, the cool thing is this connector, really it's a whole backplane for doing motion control. We're opening up the backplane and saying, build any board you want. Um, build it onto a carrier board like this one. So this is really an Arduino. This has got um, the um, this has got the Atmel on it and four backplane slots. So five amp controller, two amp controller, heated build platform, uh, extruder, PWM, laser controller. The idea is here's an open uh, connector. Build what you want. You know um, you can put anything on the on the board you want. You could say you can say I don't want it to be Arduino. I want it to be an arm. So you can put an arm on it. I want it to just be a serial port so I can drive it with Mach 3, with, uh, with Mach 3 or EMC. So basically it's a system we're trying to put together for all of these different cases. So anyway, that's my talk. And I, I brought some of the boards in, which, you know, uh, when we're done, I can, you know, pass them around. But, uh, they're not all built. That one's obviously just a model. All right, so yes, this is, this is an impromptu talk, uh, I'm, and I'm motivated by just some events of the last few weeks, even, that have raised this question. So a lot of us became interested in hacking in the hacker community because of early cyberpunk literature, William Gibson, Neil Stevenson, Philip K. Dick, Stanislaw Lem, et cetera. And, and that was projecting into a future. But the question is, now has potentially some elements of that future arrived, and are we accelerating more into that? future. And I would say the events of the last few years, even the last few months, with the Great Recession, uh, revelations about Occupy, the Arab Spring, make us, make us take this question seriously. Slavoj Žižek, this uh, Slovenian philosopher, says, are we living in an age where we recognize things are catastrophic but not serious? So that there's catastrophic things happening around us with mass surveillance, the destruction of the environment, but even the recognition of that becomes sort of a cute joke. And so this is what I want to avoid is the observation that we're living in a cyberpunk dystopia comes off as, isn't that cute? I like cyberpunk. But do we have a language for actually taking that seriously and doing something about it? And that's the question. I want to, to this no longer to be a cliche, but to consider, are we part of the resistance of the cyberpunk world? Now, the cyberpunk has a few different characteristics. First, we talked about massive numbers of people on the margins of society. There was a study a few weeks ago with the Department of Labor said that 50% of the people in the United States are either near poverty or in poverty, which means they essentially have no assets at all, and they're living on the total margins of society. Um, and, that's, and we're seeing that now with 10 cities and other things around the country. Second, corporate power totally untrammeled. And I think that that has been visualized more than ever by the financial crisis of 2008 with nobody going to jail, with, with a, sort of a public recognition that that was a massive crime, but no seeming sanction, no functions in the system to deal with that. Seems to be total corporate impunity. And we could go on examples. And third, the key thing in cyberpunk is usually there's a small elite group, technically sophisticated people, who want to come together, who are working on the margins of society and are offering some form of resistance. And that could be seen as Occupy, or that could be seen as the hackerspace community, or other communities that are coming together to try to build some humanity out of an atomized, corporate-controlled existence. Now, I just want to talk about a few stories in the last few weeks that I think have brought this into collection. First, there was a Wired story about two months ago that was very well publicized about a massive facility that's being built in Utah that is storing all, uh, all email communications and all telephone calls. This is the premise, using uh, Israeli-made uh, Israeli technology to, to sap all communications, essentially, that go through any form of system. And they're saying that's according to the Fourth Amendment, because as long as they don't listen to them, uh, then it's not violating U.S. citizens' rights. But nobody seems to take it seriously that they're not actually listening to these communications. Because how do they know whether it's a foreign national unless they listen to it? The idea is they can spy on foreign nationals, but how do you know if you don't listen to the call? Second is these, there are two major reports in the New York Times that just came out. First, uh, just last week there was a report that says the Stuxnet virus that went into Iran was actually engineered by the United States in conjunction with Israeli intelligence, which is a new form of warfare. It's not a declared war. It's a virus destroying a faci physical facility. We've never seen that before. Second, we have the flame virus, which is now seen to be, which is now a new virus that was discovered by Kapersky uh, technology in Russia, 20 times the sophistication of the Stuxnet virus, but it's actually being used for surveillance. 
that it's conceivable now that every single person on, on their computer, especially if they're using Windows, has a virus that could be listening to ambient noise, listening to uh, using their webcam. It's possible that this is ubiquitous. And the idea that these viruses are state controlled means that that may be the future we're already living in. And flame has been around for five years. It's possible that we've been living in there. The Middle East is already definitely living in to, under the cyberpunk dystopia, but we don't know if it's the US. Also, there was a New York Times story that said Obama, the presidency, is now individually deciding whether they can kill American citizens and, Amer and people overseas in a kill list, which is something that seems to be extra constitutional but is, is going forward. Also, we have Anonymous. You know, that is being treated as a terrorist movement, and it, they're using the, the, the structure of terrorism to go against a group that claims that it's doing uh, free speech resistance. Same thing with WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, Bradley Manning, who's supposed to be being tortured, and WikiLeaks, which is Interpol, is going after Julian Assange just for, for journalism activities in a, like a militaristic way. Uh, and then the Arab Spring, now the resistance, what can we do? The Arab Spring is, is kind of showing us a model and that has now been interpreted into the Occupy movement in the United States, which is interestingly enough directly tied to some of the Stevenson essay about there's a, there's a notion of one of the books where the people congregate on a bridge to fight back, reclaim public space, and use their technological knowledge to break out of the, the cyberpunk dystopia. Um, and then, but they're being fought with drone warfare and police violence. So the, my final question is just, does the hacker space, is the hacker space an institution that should be tied to uh, the resistance to the cyberpunk dystopia? Do we have to start to make moral choices on our own about how we engage with this, this, this world? Uh, and I think, and one thing I'd finally like to say is I think Pro Hack DC's Project Byzantium is probably one of the greatest examples of the cyberpunk ethic in practice. And we are privileged to be part of an institution that's doing it. The question is, can we, especially when we are in sort of the belly of the beast here in DC, can we t t take that ethic to fight against this utopia, it, dystopia, if it has arrived? Thank you. <laughs>